Okay, good evening everyone. It is a, a pleasure and a privilege to be here. Usually uh, I'm here for Emmet. It's my first time here for Chazak. And I, I speak very often at Ornava and some other places in Brooklyn. Uh, but it's a, it's a pleasure to be here for the first time. Now, when I speak about things like dating and marriage, so I'm a little bit torn because I'm very aware that Torah Anytime is here. That's Torah Anytime. And, um, and after, when Torah Anytime records, I know many thousands of people listen. So I can take one of my standard talks about dating and marriage, ones that I've given, to you, given already and give it to you, but then it'll just be a repeat of what's already on Torah Anytime. So it's a little bit of a challenge to come up with a totally different angle when it comes to dating and marriage that is relevant, just as important, but different so that for my Torah Anytime audience, they too will get something out of it. I want to start by telling you how excited I was on Friday when I have a Galaxy S3. Anyone have a Galaxy S3? One guy, okay. Anyone here have an iPhone? Because they said that it's now more popular than the iPhone, but I don't believe it. Anyhow, Galaxy S3 from Verizon is a decent phone. Um, I had a Nexus before. I'm a Verizon customer. But I was excited on Friday because I have been waiting since July for Jelly Bean. And you're all looking at me like I just dropped in from Mars. Do you know, none of you know what Jelly Bean is? <laughs> jelly Bean. Do you know what Jelly Bean is? One, one guy here. Okay. So let me, let me give you just sort of a um, Google Android 101. When you buy a Google phone, so it comes loaded with the software. And that software is pretty advanced at that time when it comes out. But a few months later, that software is outdated. And there is a new software that comes out. And that software should be sent wirelessly to your phone. And now you have updated software with extra features, and it's great. Verizon seems to have trouble getting their act together. And they're very, very late getting the new software. And therefore, Jelly Bean, and I'll tell you about that in a moment, was released in July, and it arrived December 14th. Slow. Now, but I was excited to get it, and it's called Jelly Bean. Now, Jelly Bean, Jelly Bean replaced Ice Cream Sandwich. <laughs> That's really the name of the software. And that replaced Gingerbread, which replaced Honeycomb. Are you seeing a pattern here? What's the pattern? <laughs> They're all named after yummy foods. Actually, children's foods, right? Jelly Bean... What's the next one called? Do you know? There was Froyo, we forgot. Fro right, Froyo? It's just ridiculous. But in order to get you to be interested in buying the next phone, so they name it after delicious food. So, like, you didn't just get, like, 4.1.1, which is actually its real name, but you got sweet, colorful jelly beans. So I got my jelly bean. And after I got jelly bean, my phone refreshed. And after it refreshed, it right away popped open the USA Today news. So I'm all excited. My jelly bean knew fast. By the way, it works with Project Butter. <laughs> it does. That's its name. I don't know. They've got like, they must all be overweight in the Google factory, you know? <laughs> so I'm all excited. My phone, jelly bean, pops open, USA Today. And what opens up? Man comes into school, shoots 26 people dead. And all of a sudden, that excitement over jelly bean, you know what I'm saying? All of a sudden, it seemed really ridiculous. Um, it seemed almost inappropriate. Because if you're so excited about an extra software where the screen moves a little bit faster when you take your little finger like that, then perhaps we have forgotten what's really important in life. And that stark reminder, right when my 
jelly being open to tragedy and suffering reminded me that not that there's evil in the world because I never forget that. I'm a, uh, I have Holocaust survivors within my family and uh, one cannot forget about evil. One all only needs to open the news and read and hear about evil. But what it does tell me is that we have the ability to get really unfocused and then get really focused you know, within the same minute. And that's sort of what happens in relationships. We can be very focused. We need a Ben Torah. We need someone whose Shabbat is important. We need someone who has good Midot. And all of a sudden, oh, she's so hot. What? What do you mean? What, whatever happened? A Bas Torah, I need someone. Goodness. Oh, he's cute. Cute? Where, where did that, what number in your big list of priorities did that fit in? That's literally like jelly bean that becomes, uh, that suddenly becomes silly after a minute or two. And yet we all fall into it, myself very much included. So we go from being focused, mature adults who have a plan, who have a, who, who have a goal, to people who, uh, you know, we get just caught up in silliness. So what I want to do today is I want to speak about The idea of beauty. And after we sort of get the idea of beauty down pat, we're going to go through nine ways to keep your relationship vibrant, rooted, based in the Torah, and perhaps ways that you could find your basheret regardless of how old you are, regardless of your background, regardless of your history, whether you've been married or divorced. Rules that are the same across the board, okay? Originally, I was going to call this talk before and after. And the reason why is um, I have a daughter who just got engaged. Uh, thank you, Mazel Tov. She just got engaged uh, about three weeks ago. Very excited. She's not my oldest. I have two older sons that are on the market. But... Uh, <laughs> But she jumped ahead, which is just fine by me. I, I was never in favor of making the younger wait for the older. I, I feel that that's just wrong, it's just totally wrong. You know, if it's your time, it's your time. And, you know, why hold someone back? I just, I don't see it. If, you know, if it's going to make the person feel bad, they've got to get over it and not be selfish. Even so, there is a before and after. And I'm looking at my daughter, and there's, th you know, four weeks ago before she was engaged, and now, after she's engaged, and I see a difference, I see a change, I see her trying to fit her life into his life. And to me, it's fascinating. I saw this very before and after poem. I want to read it to you because it's sort of interesting. It's not a poem, it's not a, it doesn't rhyme, but it's sort of a dialogue kind of a poem. And it's got a little bit of shtick to it, so uh, listen carefully. So it starts off with him saying, Yes, at last, it was so hard to wait. Reminds me of my, my daughter, right? After, oh, so couldn't wait. Yes, at last, it was so hard to wait. So she says, Why, you want to leave me? No, don't even, don't even think about it. But do you love me? Of course. Have you ever been unfaithful to me? No, why are you even asking? But will you, will you kiss me? Yes. Will you hurt me? No, I'm not, such, I'm not that kind of a person. Can I trust you? Yes. You're my darling, she says. And that's so beautiful. That's before marriage, not the kissing part, because we're firm, right? But that, that, that's so beautiful, right? But then, if you read that entire thing backwards, that's after marriage. Want to read the backwards? It's scary. Ready, let's read exactly what I just said backwards. She says, darling, yes. She says, can I trust you? No way. I'm not that kind of a person. Will you hurt me? Yes. Will you kiss me? No. Why are you even asking? <laughs> right. Have you ever been unfaithful to me? Of course. Do you love me? No, I don't even think about it. Do you want me to leave? 
Yes, at last. It's been so hard for me to wait. <laughs> exactly the same backwards. Ay, ay, ay. That's, that's the before and after. We come in starry-eyed. We're all excited. I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't wait. And the anticipation is all the fun. It's like my kids are going to Israel soon. And I say, are you excited? Are you excited? Yes. What are you going to do? I'm going to get on the plane. And then we're going to fly. Yes. And we're going to go like so high. Yeah, the... And then I realize that for my nine-year-old and my seven-year-old, going to Israel means going on a plane. <laughs> yes, but when you get this, okay, we'll worry about it then. But at least I get to fly high on a plane. So too, when we're engaged and we're in love, we're all excited. And yes, I get to have a wedding and a photographer. And will it be a four-piece band or a five-piece? And my daughter, she, she called me. I came from out of town. I drove in from Boston. <clears throat> I couldn't even go home. I had to go to the dress store to see her try on dresses. I'm a good father. <laughs> there I am. Her try, right? And then, and then I go to the hall and we have to, do we need a sax? Do we need a, a guitarist? Do we need a drummer? Can any of it be, be electric? Does it have to be live? And on and on. All the excitement is building. But the excitement is not the marriage. Of course not. Marriage is hard work. Marriage is tough. Sometimes it's brutal. Sometimes it doesn't even last. So let's speak a little bit about beauty. The world struggles with the concept of beauty. In the 1600s, the heavier a lady was, the more attractive she was. Do you know that? Yes, she, if she was heavy, she could hold a lot of children, she has girth. Where you picture the you know the old Russian mamas right there, to God, and they're a, uh, you, you picture. I'm sorry if you're Russian over here. My grandmother's Russian. I've got the pictures to prove right. They're right, right. They're, if you walked in like a model today, they would think, it's like, "Oi, Nebuch, she's got no food. Nebuch, she doesn't eat. Oh, and she throws up all the time. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Right? That's the model's thing. Because the definition of beauty has changed." and continues to change. So, what is beauty? Once on an article where they try to explain that beauty is symmetry because little children are attracted to a symmetrical face. So if your cheekbones and your nose and your chin, but we know that's nonsense because all you need to do is look at people who are considered beautiful in the media today, and they look very different. And some are not symmetrical at all. And sometimes people look too symmetrical, and they look like Barbie dolls are not pretty at all. They, they're plasticky. And right away you say, wow, they must, have, they must have spent a pretty penny on that face. Right? That's not natural. So what is beauty? Hanukkah was tragically just over. We just davened Meyerv. But we're going to invoke Hanukkah to describe beauty. You see, there was a great battle between the Greeks and the Jews. And the great battle boiled down to the definition of beauty. That was the great battle. Let's go back a little bit. The Greeks. Who do they come from? Noah, Noach, had three children, Shem, Ham, and Yafes. Now, we all know the story. Noah, after the flood, decided he's going to plant plants and once again create agriculture so that people in the world would have what to eat. And so he planted grapes, grape seeds, vineyards. The grapes came about, the vines began to grow, and Noah came and he took that, those grapes and he made wine. And with that wine he drank and he got drunk. And at that point after he got drunk, he got naked. Now why did he get naked? It's a very, there are some deep ideas over here. One idea was that it wasn't his fault. He didn't want to do it. It was the middle son, Ham. The middle son said, I don't want another child being born to my father. 
Because right now, we're the only three heirs to planet Earth. Me, my older son, my, my brother Shane, and my brother Yafes. Three sons. And if they have another child, there's going to be a fourth son. And we're going to have to divide the world four ways. Nebuch. Not enough for everyone. And therefore, not only did he get his father naked, but without, becoming, without getting graphic, he caused his father not to be able to have children any longer. So Chum did something terrible. And then he left the room. And his father was lying there drunk, naked, abused. Shame and Yafesh walk in. And Shame says, this is terrible. We must cover our father. Come, Yafesh, help me cover him. And they covered over their father's embarrassment. When their father woke up and he realized everything that had happened, he understood the nature of each of his children. And he said, each of my children I'm going to pronounce either a blessing or a curse that will be your destiny. Cham, you, what you did was terrible. You are cursed. You will be a slave to your brothers. Shame, what you did was noble. Not only did he cover his father, but he turned his own face away so he wouldn't look at his father's nakedness. So shame, you are going to get wisdom. You are going to have leadership. And Yafas, you, you will have beauty. And your beauty will be significant when you reside in the tent of your brother shame. The Yishkon Baalei Shem Yafes, you will have beauty, and that beauty will be worthwhile when you dwell in the house of your brother Shame. Now, this entire episode is very cryptic. Number one, think about this a moment. Each of their names means something. What does the name Chum mean? What does Chum mean? It means warm, from the word Cham. Warm. We're right? Warm. Brown is chum, and that's also because a person's out in the sun, they get brown, they get warm, right? So he named one of his sons warm. What does the name Yafes mean? From which word? Yafe, which means beauty. And what does the name shame mean? Name. So he named his son name. But did he run out of names? <laughs> There are only two other kids in the world. You name your son name? Of course, he named them before the flood. So he names one of his sons warmth, one of his sons beauty, and one of his sons name. What's going on here? It's strange, right? So the answer is that each one of these names, probably given through Ruach HaKodesh, each one of these names speak about the character of their child. And each of these characters can be used for good or for bad. And we have to understand the character. Chum is easy. Chum is warmth. Chum is hot. You're warm-blooded. And Kabbalah means that you're red. Right? There are four colors that are mentioned in Kabbalah. Four different kinds of nature that we have. And they're listed as green, red, white, and black. Red is that warmth, that impulsive person. That person is very passionate, but that person could also do terrible things with that passion. Chum, for his lust and his greed, he did something terrible to his father. Yafas is beauty. Beauty could be used for good, and it could be used for evil as well. Somebody can seduce someone else, and they can do terrible things with that seduction. And what a shame. So we have to we have to understand the name shame. Here we go. Oops. The name shame. What does shame mean? So, in order to understand this, we must understand the Hebrew alphabet and Lashon Kodesh. And here's how it goes. This is a what is this, everybody? This is a cup. Amen. Why is this a cup? 
Anyone tell me, what does the sound cup have to do with this? Nothing. One day somebody said, this reminds me of the word cup, so we'll call this cup. If this had been called an elephant, I'd be drinking water from an elephant. And we laugh at it because it means something else now. But what does the word elephant have to do with something with a trunk and tusks? Nothing. Right? Words are arbitrary. They have nothing to do with the object. And that's why we can have so many languages. As a matter of fact, there are so many languages when the, after the flood, people wanted to build a tower against the Almighty. And it was known as Migdal Bavel. And God said, no, you're not building a tower to fight against me. Nasalanu shame, let's make a name for ourselves. Let's fight the Almighty. Let's prop up the sky. There shouldn't be another flood. God says, nothing doing. You're not going to make a uh, tower against me. Come on, I'm everywhere. So what did Hashem do? He mixed up their languages so they couldn't understand each other. By the way, that's why when you can't hear a person speaking, it's called that they babble. Because in the Tower of Babel is where their language got all mixed up. So it's called Migdal Bavel, or in English, Babel. So a baby babbles. No one can understand him. So in English, or French, or Spanish, or Russian is meaningless. Dos Vidania means nothing if you're American. Spasiba, Pajalusta, it's all, it's, it means nothing, right? Does it mean anything? Terel, right? Noj, it means nothing because these are all, these are all arbitrary words. It means, it means nothing. Hebrew is different. Not regular Hebrew, but the holy tongue. Lashon Kodesh is something else entirely. The way to understand it is, if you take that cup and you break it down, you're going to get molecules. And from those molecules, you're going to get atoms. And in those atoms, you're going to find electrons, protons, and neutrons. And you keep on going down, and you'll get quarks, and you get sprites, and keep going further and further, and you get strings. You name it, it just goes really, really, really tiny. We think an electron is so small, the reality is that it's pretty big compared to the smaller, smaller particles that exist in the universe. Our understanding is that if you keep going down further and further until you get to the very building blocks of the universe, you will find the alphabet. You will get Lashon Kodesh. You will get Hebrew. And that's the very building blocks. The words are not representative of an object, but the words actually are the object. The object is a composite of the words. So that's why when it says in Bereshit, Vayomer Elohim mihi or, vayihi or, and God said, let there be light, and there was light, when did he make the light? The answer is, by saying it, it became light. The words become the object. That's why the word davar means an object, and the word davar means a word. The word for word and the word for object are the same word. It's amazing. As a matter of fact, if a magician wants to pull a rabbit out of his hat, so he takes a rabbit, takes a hat, what does he say? Abracadabra. Abracadabra is Hebrew. Abracadabra. I will create as I speak. Abra, right, from the word bore, abra, I will create Kedabra, like I speak. I will speak it and it will be. Isn't that fascinating? They go home, tell ah, abracadabra. Right? That's why it says in Breshit that Adam, Adam, had this great wisdom that he was able to understand the nature of each animal and give it its proper name. A dog is a kelev. Why? Because it has the word lev in it. Kilev, he understands your heart. Man's best friend. He underst Adam understood that. So words become the object, okay? The word, the name Shem, which was one of the sons of Noah, that name was not simply he named him name. There was a great blessing being called name because the word name means the essence, the name, 
the building blocks, the internal of what this object is, says Noach, Yefes, I'm giving you beauty. Beauty, gorgeous. The Yishkon Ba'ahle shame. But outward beauty is worth nothing unless it resides in the tent of shame. Unless it has inner meaning. If it has inner meaning, then it's beautiful. But if it doesn't have inner meaning, then it's hollow. It's coins. They clank on the table. That's all it is. Is anything beautiful about gold per se? Not really. Not really. You know how I'll prove it? Take silver. Silver is beautiful. But there are many, there, there are many um, metals out there that look like silver, but you wouldn't want, you know, you wouldn't value it because it doesn't have this kind of internal value. The fact that it's rare, the fact that we, that we attach meaning to it. Not only that, I'll give you something that's gold-plated, but you'd rather the gold than the gold-plated, wouldn't you? It's got to have meaning attached to it. The beauty alone is not sufficient. Correct? That's why, the, this is so beautiful, if you've never heard this, the Vilna Gon says this. He says, at the very end, when we sing, Eishat Chayil, I want a beautiful wife. I want a, a, a woman of valor. So we say at the very end, Shlomo HaMelech says, Sheker achein hevel ayofi, Isha yirat Hashem, he titalal. Sheker achein, grace is a lie, charm, charisma, that's a lie. Hevel ayofi, beauty, it's vanity, it's nothingness. Isha yirat Hashem, but a lady who is God-fearing, he titalal, she is praiseworthy. Says the Vilna Gon, are you saying that beauty is nothing? How could beauty be nothing? The Talmud and the Torah go out of their way at different points to describe people who are beautiful. Yosef was, was, was called beautiful in the Torah. Somebody who was beautiful. Esther Amalka, she was beautiful. The Gemara even speaks about the four most beautiful women in the world and names them by name. We value beauty. So what is Shlomo HaMelech saying? Sheker achein, hevel ayofi, that beauty is nothingness. Says the Vilna Gon, no, it doesn't mean beauty is nothingness. What it means is that if there's no God-fearing quality to this person, if they don't have morals, if they don't have values, so then the beauty is nothing. It's a cutout. It's a cutout. That's all it is. But if they're God-fearing, if they truly have values and morals and ethics, and they're people who know how to do chesed and they want to make the world a better place, guess what? Then the beauty is actually valuable. Then the grace, then the charm, then the charisma is worthwhile. We don't say, eh, we don't look at beauty. We just look at... No. Beauty's, beauty's good. Beauty's nice but make sure that it's connected to a God-fearing quality. And I'll tell you something pretty amazing. Sometimes you could find someone who's not so beautiful, they're not strikingly beautiful, but because they have a grace, a charm that comes from a God-fearing quality, men will see beauty in that, and women will see beauty in that. I see it all the time. We do a lot of single events, and there are guys who are really good looking, and the girls are scoping them out. I, you know, that's, that's, that's what's supposed to happen, right? And you'll see guys who think that they're all that, and they're all cool, and they're like joking with their friends. You know who the girls are interested in? If during the meal they're singing, and the guy who begins to sing, Guess what? The girls are, are looking at that guy. They're not looking at the guy chumming around with his friends. Because that guy, the one who sings, the one who has simcha, the one who's got that extra quality, that confidence that they're living a life of spirituality and meaning, is that not more attractive than the guy who's going like this to his friends? Is it? Right? I always see it's always the guy who gets into things. The one whose tefillah is the real tefillah. That's attractive. And for the guys, you should know it's the same thing. You think, and for those of you who are watching this Torah anytime, here are the men, here are the women. <laughs> so when I point over here, I'm pointing at men, here are women. I want to tell you, men, 
you know, or actually women, you'd think the guys only care about, oh, she's got to have a perfect figure and she's got to, she's got to look. I want to tell you something. I had a singles event at the house. And when, some, sometimes I have sort of random singles, but once in a while I'll make a singles event that we really try to attract top, top quality men and women because I just, I want a marriage to come from this Shabbat. And we vet everyone who comes. We want people who have shown stability and they're healthy and emotionally. And, like we really check them out. And we made one of these Shabbatones and the guys came in and they were like real, real quality guys. They had their lives put together and they knew what they wanted to do and they had Parnassa and they had this and that. And it was just like a bumper crop of amazing guys. But it was also a bumper crop of amazing girls. And the girls came in and I'm thinking, wow, there's going to be electricity this Shabbat town. It was just one of these amazing, you don't get, you know, we, we had 30 of each. You don't get 60 people in the room that are that quality. But then one girl came in and she was vetted. But I felt a little bit like she's going to have a tough time. Because perhaps looks wise, and that's what happens when you have just a Shabbaton, you only have 24 hours, so usually the guys are going to run. You know, they're going to get attracted initially to the girl that's most attracted to them. And there were certain girls who were very attractive. And this girl was, you couldn't say that she was in that category. And I felt a little bit like, oh no, what's going to be? Until, until, Friday night, we go around and we make l'chaims. That's what we do. If you've been to my house, right? We make a l'chaim, we did that. We go around it. And it was this girl's turn to make a l'chaim. And people were making l'chaims. They were silly l'chaim. Hey, l'chaim. And they were trying to make jokes. This girl opens up her mouth. She was a smarty. She spoke a beautiful Hebrew. I think Israeli originally. And she says, <laughs> You know, with a smile and this beautiful, beautiful bracha emerged from her and it was so attractive that when she finished within five minutes four or five guys came over to me and says okay, what's the deal with that girl? <laughs> That's the girl and I want to tell you the one girl who came in who Totally, you could tell she, she sort of thought she was all that, you know? And like all the guys right away gravitated towards her. By the end of Shabbat, she was sitting on her own. Like no one's coming over. She didn't make an effort. She, you know, I guess she had probably lived on her looks for a little bit too long. She hadn't developed that personality. And it was a little bit, it was a little bit depressing. And those who showed simcha. Okay. So what we say is beauty, thumbs up. We're all for beauty. Now, let's, let's forward history, okay? Alexander the Great comes in, and Alexander the Great is here in order to... Okay, we're going to have to go th quick through this because we're a little bit late. Alexander the Great conquers the world. He wants to conquer Jerusalem, Yerushalayim. As he's going to, with his army heading towards Yerushalayim, he is greeted by the high priest, Shimon Tzadik. And Shimon Tzadik, who knew that Alexander was coming, is dressed in his beautiful garments, the eight garments of the Kohen Gadol. And he walks over to Alexander, and Alexander falls on the ground and says, Wow, it's you! And all the soldiers says, What do you mean? You know that Jewish rabbi? He says, Yes, I've seen that man in a dream. Every time before I go to war, I see that man wearing these garments in a dream and he tells me whether I'm going to be successful or not. That man, he's a great man and Shemana Tzadik says, please don't attack Yerushalayim and he didn't. Alexander the Great didn't just conquer countries and peoples. He also conquered their minds. He introduced a philosophy that until this day in Queens, in Forest Hills, in New York, that Greek mentality still remains. That beauty, 
Vavavum, they used to call it in the 1950s and 60s, right? That hotness, that look, that GQ, you got to look. People have to look at you and they have to, there's that Greek quality that is devoid of meaning that we can celebrate simply the external. If I can't see it, it doesn't exist. You all know that in the great theaters and the great coliseums in Greece during the Olympics, when they would throw their discus or they would throw their javelins, what was the uniform that they dressed in? Their birthday suit, that's right. They would, they would compete in their birthday suit. Why? Because why are we covering up the body? There's no shame. Comes, comes Shemana and Tzadik and Shemana and Tzadik says, you're wrong. It's not just about outer beauty, but it has to be connected to inner beauty. And this has to do with numbers. And here is the number. The magical number over here is eight. Eight nights of Hanukkah. We just finished that last night. The eighth night. What is the great difference between eight and seven? We find that seven is always this world. What I can see, the world was created in seven days, including Shabbat, but that's the world. After that, after that, there's the number eight. There are seven skies, on top of them is Kisei Kavod. That's the eighth. That's the connection. It's different, but there's a connection. Seven days is not enough for Brit Milah. You need to have eight because the organ that a Brit Milah is done on can be used for lots of things that are inappropriate, but it could also be used for Kedusha. You have to transcend. So here's going to be our definition of beauty. Beauty, by definition, is two things that are opposite, but that interact harmoniously. And by the way, this definition applies to everything. You see, two things that are very similar when they're combined are not beautiful. What's majesty? What's beauty? Anyone here into music? Anyone here play music? Okay, you play, a beautiful, you play beautiful music, so you've got a harmony and a melody. You've got counterpoint. You've got a note going up and a note going down, but they don't clash. If they clash, it doesn't work. But if they're opposite, but they complement each other, that's beauty. A high voice and a low voice. You have beauty. In photography, a composition that shows contrast. You've got a mountain range and you've got the valley and the river. And together, there is beauty. Things that are similar, not a lot of beauty there. We're similar. Things that show a difference and yet that combination. You can be God-fearing and yet externally beautiful. That's what the office was all about. You can be beautiful, but somehow you have to live in the house of shame. You have to live in the house of beauty. And this was the message of Hanukkah. This is why Shimon Atzadi came out with the eight garments. The number eight is the key over here. The number eight is the transcendent number. Yerushalayim, Yerushalayim, there's a Yerushalayim Shalmala and Yerushalayim Shalmata. There's a heavenly Yerushalayim and an earthly one. Do you know that? And these two Yerushalayims combine. You ever been to Eretz Israel? Ever been to Israel? You remember? You're on the plane. You're flying. An hour to go, we'll be in Ben Gurion. 35 minutes, 18 minutes. You're looking out. The plane is low enough. You see the Mediterranean. And now you see land. And you know that the land that you see is Israeli land. Then you come off the plane. You know, it used to be in the olden days, it was, so, it was so warm because you came off the plane and you can bend down on the ground and kiss the ground. But today they changed the airport. So you go right through the, sort of the, that, that little tunnel. You go straight from the, uh, uh, from the airplane to the airport. You have no chance to bend down and kiss the ground, all that romantic feeling. Anyone know what I'm talking about? You know what I mean? Of course, in the old days, it still wasn't exactly because it wasn't ground, it was asphalt. So you were sort of kissing, it didn't feel that romantic, but at, at least it was ground, right? Now it's nothing. Right? Now, 
right? But that amazing feeling, Yerushalayim is amazing. Eretz Yisrael is beautiful. What's so beautiful about it? The answer is because there's a contrast. There's a heaven and an earth and they interact. Because they interact and there's a contrast, says the Gemara, ten portions of beauty were introduced to the world, nine grabbed by Yerushalayim, one was distributed and dispersed to the rest of the world. So our definition of beauty is when there are opposites that find a way to connect. And that's going to be the opening to what we're going to do now, which will be pretty quick, go through how, even though we are opposites, even though when we're looking for someone, and we say, oh, they got to be Sephardi because I'm Sephardi. No, they got to be Persian because I'm Persian. They got to be Bukhari. Why? Says who? Says what? Oh, my parents say that. <laughs> Fight it. Fight it. Okay? My sister, she is a lovely, wonderful girl born in Cleveland, Ohio. And her grandparents, one comes from Hasidish blood. Bells, the other one comes from Yekish blood, Frankfurt, and my sister went off and she married a Persian Chacham. <laughs> Great looking kids. You know? Why not? We feel like this resistance, this resistance to opposites. But the, and, and of course, it doesn't always work out. But we have to know that when it does work out, it's a thing of beauty. And, and it could work out. And we don't give it a chance. So let's, let's discuss this. Here we go. First off, before we begin, I want to tell you something that has never been said on camera, I don't believe, but it must be said. If you're going out, and I would say no matter how old you are, please use a shatran. Please use a shatran. Now, I say this, listen carefully. Listen carefully. Shh. A shadchan is not what you think. You think a shadchan, when you think of a shadchan, a matchmaker, you think a fiddler on the roof. <laughs> matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match. Right? That's Yenta. Oh, Yenta's got this boy and he's great. He's, very, he's crippled, but otherwise, you know, he's still, right? That's not shadchan. A shadchan has three roles. There are three different things that a shatran does. And sometimes you don't need one or even two of them. You have to know what you need out of a shatran and how they can help you. But just to discount the shatran because, oh, I don't want to have anyone else involved, I believe is a mistake. So here are the three roles of the shatran. So just so you should know, because people don't speak about it, they say, oh, yes, yeah, shatran, oh, Three different things. Number one, a shadchan's job is to help find you a guy or a girl. That's number one role of a shadchan. So, if you don't have a guy or a girl, they may have a nice suggestion. Role number two is they get a yes from that guy or girl. It's one thing to see someone across the room and say, hey, what about you two? You ever have friends who do that? What about you, what about you guys? It's not good enough to say, what about? You got to get a yes. So the second role is to get the yes. The third role is to navigate, once they're going out, someone they can speak to when things are not going so smoothly. That's the third role. And that's a very important role of a shadchan, to be able to navigate. Even if you have found a girl on your own and you got a yes on your own, get a shadchan involved. Because in every courting process, in every courtship, there are bumps in the road. And without a shadchan, your greatest bet is that that shidduch, that potential mate is going to leave you. It's not going to work out. But if there's somebody who will help you navigate, and they don't have to be professional, but just somebody that she could call and say, you know what, I, I thought he was the guy for me, but he's not because you know what he did tonight? So instead of her dropping him, the shot will say, well, you know what? Hold on a moment. I hear, I don't, that's really appalling if that's what he did. 
let me get his side of the story and find out what was going on. And the shotgun will call him up and he'll say, oh, no, 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 I, you know, I, I didn't hang up on my mother or whatever. It was a beep and she hung up, right? And then the shotgun will come back and say, no, it's, it, it's totally not what you thought. And once again, it's put together. How many shiduchim fall apart because of misunderstandings or misconceptions that are just inaccurate, that if there was somebody... I had a guy came over to me, he was a student of mine, and he says, Rabbi, and I knew he was going out with this girl, and he says, Rabbi, she called me and she's, she's dropping me. We've been going out for months, I don't know what happened. Put it together again. I said, I can't. I, I haven't been involved. What am I supposed to do? Call, call her up and beg on my hands and knees you should take him back? I said, if you, have got, if you had gotten me involved earlier, then maybe I would have had a dialogue with her and I could have called her and said, look, what's going on? You suddenly drop him. Oh, I'm dropping him because of, the, because of my father. Because of, right? So let me speak to your father. Me as a shot, and I could have mediated and I could have made it work. But now I said it's just preposterous for me to just pop in, drop in in the middle to save the day. I'm not a relief pitcher. So the thing is, he was a student of mine and he really begged me and I couldn't say no to him so I did go and I begged on my hands and knees and, and I did and I, I normally wouldn't but I did and, and I became the matchmaker and I put it back together and now they're married with a few children they're living in Israel but this was this ended this, this, this ended and if there hadn't been a matchmaker we did. so do yourselves a favor don't be too cool to get someone else involved it makes sense sometimes a couple becomes so close in the courtship that they can't really say what's on their mind. And then you'll never know. And then when they drop the bomb, you won't know how to react to it. Okay, here we go. Knock them off. Number one, invest 100% even if the other person is not investing 100%. When we're in a relationship, sometimes we're really doing what we should be doing, but sometimes we get a little bit absorbed in ourselves. And when we get absorbed in ourselves, we're not putting that effort into the relationship. When that happens, and that's your spouse, rule number one, these are, these are going to be nine rules. Rule number one is keep putting 100% in. Don't say tit for tat. They're giving me 50%. I'll give 50%. They're doing 25. I'm doing 25. No. Now, if long term, they've stopped putting in 100% long term, so then you may have to see a marriage counselor. You have to find out what's going on. But in the course of a marriage, people stop putting in 100% at all times. There are times when they don't. When they don't, you put in 100% and really put in 110%. Because it'll become so obvious that they're not pulling their weight in the relationship, that if you're in a otherwise healthy relationship, they will rebound back. So rule number one, in order to keep your relationship before and after going well, if they don't put in 100%, don't drop the ball, you put in 100%. Number two, be interesting. Be interesting. Be interesting. There is this some, there's this conception out there that love will carry us through. Love, 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 love. Guess what? We live in the world. And there's news in the world. There are things that are going on. We have causes that we're committed to. And if one side is very interested in the world, what's going on, whatever it is, and the other side says, oh, well, that's, that's okay, you know, that's good for them suddenly you're becoming an uninteresting partner. And if you're not an interesting partner, if you're not an interesting person, the, then your partner's going to lose their attraction to you. Look, looks are good in the beginning. But everyone knows, everyone knows that you can get used to looks and looks fade. Those two are very critical points. I remember a few years ago, there was an actor who was married to a woman and I don't want to say the actor's name, but he was married to a woman that many people considered to be one of the most beautiful women in the world. Beautiful woman. And guess what? He was arrested soliciting a lady walking on the street, 
You know what kind of a lady I'm talking about? And, and everyone was waiting for the picture of this lady. Like, wow, if you're married to the most beautiful woman in the world and you're trying to pick up another lady, she must be even more beautiful. And then the news came out with the picture of the lady. And you looked at her and you say, what the heck? <laughs> what? You're married? Like, where's... And, and, and it, was, it was so astonishing. It was so astonishing that there were opinion columns in the newspaper trying to explain how a guy who was married to this kind of girl could be running after that kind of... Right? The answer is that looks can only take you so far and we get used to looks. Not only do we get used to looks, but after you're married, people will realize that you don't come out of bed looking like this. Guys, are gonna, guys have no idea how much preparation it takes for a girl to walk out on the street. Right? I know, I'm married. Like, what? Like, for a guy, what do we do? We put on a shirt, maybe it's from yesterday, maybe two days ago. Right? <laughs> we put on the shirt, we put on our shoes. The guy's version of combing his hair is, boom, done. That's what I did. Yay! Hair combed, teeth, uh, teeth, teeth brushed. <laughs> right? Right? That's the thing. Go, yeah. That's the guy. Tucks himself in. Yeah, no. Shoes untied. For a girl, it's, it's like, this, this. You don't even know how many products there are. Right? Lip gloss, the lip liner, the lip, the lip, right? the lip liner, the lip, right? that's just the lips. Right? And then the eye and the eye shadow and the eye mascara. Right? So what's going to happen is one day you'll be married and the guy will realize that it took, that, that you're not natural like that. And you know what will probably happen? They'll say, you know, I like you better without the makeup, right? That, that's a little secret guys will tell you. Right, guys? Stop it with all the makeup. Anyways, I only tell you that because of Shabbos. Because, you know, there, there, we, have, we, have, um, we, all, we have a lot of girls over for Shabbos. And I, and I notice some of them end up putting on makeup on Shabbos. And it's, a, it's an Avera. It's Del Rice. It's a very severe Avera. But because we've got singles, because we have singles, so they say, I've got to look my best. So I'm telling you, your best is without all the shmir. We don't like the shmir, right? right? You know? Anyhow, be that as it may, looks will only take you so far. You've got to be an interesting person. You're going to get to be older. And, and when you're older, the attraction has to be in, on a deeper level. And the attraction will come because you've had life experiences together and you've been through tough times together. But part of the attraction will be because you're fun to speak to. You're interesting to be around. So number two, you want to keep the fire burning, be interesting. Number three, and again, this they don't usually say this in Chazak, I imagine, but uh, I don't know, maybe they won't invite me back. Who knows? <laughs> I may have already crossed a few lines. I don't know. Be romantic. You know, uh, and I, I just hear that my daughter does that all the time. Oh, yeah. I, I heard the O oh in the back. Yeah, my daughter, right? You hear, I have three daughters. They're all O oh to each other, right? Well, you know, when we speak, speak about romance, and this is sort of tough because we grow up especially if you grew up religious, you grew up in sort of a, an environment that doesn't speak about romance a lot, you should be aware that the Torah is full of romance. It's full of romance. It's full of romance. Not just Shir Hashirim speaking about us and God. No, think about it this. If, if the metaphor that is being used between us and God is a metaphor of a man and a woman, it must be that it's a good thing for a man and a woman to have that romantic relationship. Otherwise, a metaphor would make no sense. Does that make sense to you? So we have to be a little bit open. And within the Jewish world, I want to tell you, within the religious world, we have it harder than the non-religious world. Because within the religious world, we don't listen to love songs. We don't go dancing. So a lot of the expressions of romance that the world uses, the religious world doesn't use, which means that you've got to pile on romance in other ways. You understand what I'm saying? And there are ways of doing it, right? 
send a romantic text message, send, leave a romantic note, right? There are ways of saying it, and somehow, the, any, anyone remember the, uh, anyone see Fiddler on the Roof here? There is a, there's a song called, Do You Love Me? You know what I'm talking about? Do you love me? And he says back, do I love you? Yeah, well, I've cooked your clothing, I've mended your clothing, so that's got to be love, right? Do you love me? Well, I guess I love, right? That, it's, a, it's a stereotype. It's a stereotype that if you're religious, you can't, you can't express love. It's not so. It's not so. You have to, and it's healthy for the children, but done in a sneistic way. But it's got to be done. So be romantic. Number four. This is my favorite rule tonight. Ready for the favorite? Whoever apologizes first wins. It's my favorite rule. You apologize first, you're the winner. You got couples, you've got these arguments, these disagreements daily. You're going to have disagreements, you're going to. Think about it, think about it. Think about being married. Are you hungry now? He's not hungry now. You're hungry now, she's hungry now. Do you want to eat sushi? He wants to eat steak. Do you want to go to bed? He doesn't want to go to bed. Is the bill paid? Is the bill not paid? Should we go on vacation? Should we not? On and on and on and on. There are disagreements. And sometimes, sometimes those disagreements become arguments. When they become arguments, and arguments are not the worst thing. They're, they're a way of expressing ourselves. I once heard this from a great, great rub. His name was Rabbi Avram Blumenkrantz. He passed away. And he said it over in the name of somebody who I forget. But so I'll just leave it by Rabbi Blumenkrantz. He said, I, and he said, I couldn't say this if I hadn't heard it from this great rabbi. But he said that you find by the forefathers that they couldn't have children until after their first argument. It's true. Look at it. Until they had their first disagreement. Havali van, give me children. Instead of God, first argument, they have a child. Right? There had to be some, sorry, Rabbi Blumenkrantz said this, said that that rawness of first being able to express, so it's, there's nothing wrong with a disagreement. You know that Yitzchak and Rivka there was a great age gap between the two. You're aware of that, right? One was 40, the other one was 3. That's right. This is a 37-year age gap. They didn't see, they didn't see eye to eye to the point that not only didn't they agree who should get the brachot, but do you realize that Rivka refused to call Yaakov Yaakov? You'll never see Rivka calling Yaakov Yaakov because she said, He's not going to be the Akiv of his brother. Yitzchak, it says they both called Esav Esav, Vayikrishma Esav, but when it came time to Yaakov, it says, and Yitzchak called him Yaakov, Vayikrishma Yaakov, but not Rivka. Rivka said, no, he can't be the heel of his brother. He can't be stomped on, he can't be a partner, and he can't be uh, subjugated by his brother. Rivka did not even agree with Yitzchak, but they had love, but they had disagreements. So, when you have a disagreement, when you have an argument, when things get a little bit rocky, don't wait for the other one to apologize. Be the man, even if you're a woman. You know? Be the first. Whoever apologizes first wins. You're the winner. In my book, in the book of the Almighty, of course, and in your spouse's book. And you have to know this even when you're dating. Okay, next. Don't forget to compliment. Why do I say this? Because today, in our jaded world, compliments always have a motive. You, there's a little bit of flattery. Hey, nice this, nice that. Right? You try to schmear up who you could schmear up. But there is a compliment for the sake of making the other person feel good. And I don't mean pleases and thank yous. I mean, wow. You made such a delicious, delicious dish tonight. Wow, you're such an amazing person. You always bring home a paycheck on time. You're, 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 that's, that's an important thing. <laughs> you know, you're, you're, you, you should know, I cannot tell you, I cannot tell you how many women make the mistake 
of taking for granted that their husband bring home, uh, brings home a paycheck. Why are you taking it for granted? It was hard work. He had to deal perhaps with a boss that he didn't get along with. He had to, he had to get there early, he had to spend extra time at night, all in order to bring home a paycheck. As a matter of fact, when he brings home a paycheck, say thank you for the paycheck. Don't assume, don't take for granted. You wouldn't want if he took for granted you doing what your job is, whatever your task is, however you divided it up. You have to say, and I want to tell you, my wife says thank you for the paycheck. She does. She says thank you for supporting. And she makes it a point to say it often. Does it make sense to you? Don't, you, you want to be appreciated that you worked hard and you came home and you didn't get fired and, you, and, and, and other people are losing their jobs and you didn't lose your, your job, thank you for the paycheck. Thank you for the clean laundry. Thank you for folding it. Thank you for caring about me. Thank you for making my favorite dish. Thank you for making special time with me. Thank you for not rushing me up, even though I know you wanted to get to the wedding on time. Thank you for giving me the time that I need. Give the compliment. You look beautiful. You look amazing, right? Even if it's a little bit of a twist. You didn't put on a single pound. <laughs> it was double digits. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay. Next. This is an idea. And the idea is following. We're, we're, we're finishing up. We're going to go fast over here. But it's an idea how people think that once we get married, their problems will be solved. Once I get married, my problems are solved. That's like saying... Once I have a baby, my problems are solved. <laughs> yeah, it's smooth. Once I have the baby, it's smooth sailing. Does that make any sense at all? A baby complicates things, right? With the crying and the this and the that, right? It's complicated with the baby, but it's fulfilling. If adding a baby to your life complicates things, so adding a spouse to your life complicates things as well. But there's nothing wrong with things being complicated. But we have to appreciate that things are going to get complicated and you're going, to, you're going to get a chance to look beyond yourself and to stretch yourself to the limit, but life gets complicated. So sometimes people say, we'll get married, get my kids married, and it'll solve their problems. They've got psychological, emotional issues, but marry them off, it'll be the other person's problem. <laughs> Not okay, don't do, don't do stuff like that, right? Right? It's complicated. More than that, when you go out, everyone's on their best behavior. You never see, you never see them acting rude. You don't see them angry. You don't smell their bad breath. You don't, you know, <laughs> you, you know, you don't have all these things that become very real after you're married. And that perfect person, that person who I thought, wow, this person is perfect, all of a sudden, they're not so perfect anymore. All of a sudden, there are chinks in the armor. Guess what? They never were perfect. So are you now married to an imperfect person? Are you married to somebody who's not perfect? No. You just have to redefine perfection. They're perfect for you. And that's not a play on words. They really are. What is perfection? If perfection is perfect on their own, then what are you doing in the relationship? They're perfect for you because they allow you to become the best you you can be. I'm not the same person that I was when I was married. I was self-centered. I, I really was. I, I, like, I couldn't see beyond myself. I thought I was this really good person. And then after I got married, I had to battle and work on those things that I wasn't comfortable with. But at the end of the day, much, much better. At the end of the day, she was perfect for me. When I got engaged to my wife, my parents looked at her and they were shocked because they expected me to marry one kind of girl and I married a totally different kind of girl. And they thought I was going to marry someone like me. And really, I married someone very, very different. But we were perfect for each other. We are now celebrating, God willing, soon our 25th anniversary. 25 years of happy marriage. Thank you. Actually, my, my wife deserves to thank you for putting up with me for 25 years. But so it is. 25 years of marriage, 
It was perfection because of the faults. You know, if you ever, if you ever seen a painting, a painting that's totally perfect is a photo. A real painting, a real work of art has what's called tension. There's tension in the art. There's tension in the music. There's tension in the beauty, which is what makes opposites so beautiful. Next, almost done here. Your mood affects the home. It's a very simple rule. Don't think, hey, cut me some slack. It's my turn to get angry. It's my turn to be moody. I always say this. Women do not realize how much their mood affects their man. Men realize when they're ogres, when they are acting rude, it totally throws the house off. But I want to tell you that women have that same power to throw their man off. And when a woman's mood is, you know, when you're down, you know what happens to a man's psyche? I'll tell you what happens. When you're down and depressed, a man says, I'm not a good husband. <laughs> I don't know how to make my woman happy. I'm a failure. Right? We really do. And when you're happy, and when you're in a good mood, and when you're up, you know, we say to ourselves, what do we say? The Who's the man? Who's the husband? Who can make his wife happy? Right? We really say these things. So therefore, you have to understand, you have to have control of your mood. And therefore, I always recommend, find things that you love, that are your security blanket, and use them. You like microwave popcorn? I do. So have, have a microwave popcorn at night. You like your diet soda? You like your warm bath? Take what you need to get yourself in the mood so that you don't bring the whole household down. Last two. This is a tough one. This is a tough one. Be open about your spiritual shortcomings. Too often, when we are married, there are things that the husband is more religious, more from about, and certain things the wife is more from about. And we're embarrassed to admit to the other one that we're not where they are. So instead, what comes out is a charade. It becomes a lie. It's not really who we are. And we never are able to grow with that, with that other person. We're never able to grow because they don't know what we're struggling with. So number eight is be open with your struggles. Tell your partner what it is that you're struggling with. Are you having a hard time with tefillah? Are you having a hard time with minyan? Are you having a hard time looking at inappropriate movies? Are you having a hard time speaking Lashon Hara? Speak to your spouse. They're there to help you. They're not there to judge you. We're not here to judge each other. But if we're not open with what we're struggling with, then you know what will happen? We'll hide our faults and we'll start being secretive and we'll start doing things behind our spouse's back because we feel that they're not going to accept us for who we are. Don't be that way. Allow yourself to be open enough. I'm not saying glorify. I don't say, hey, I'm doing it. I have no problem with it. I do have a problem with it. But I want to be open because I want to grow. But I don't want you to judge me. That's a very, very important rule and a tough rule. And if your spouse is open to you, don't judge them. Allow them to say what it is they're struggling with. Don't be an answer man. Don't say, oh, the solution to that is, like a lot of guys are. No, just listen. At that time, just listen. You too, just listen. Listen to the struggle. Address it later. Be grateful that your relationship is strong enough that you can be open with what that struggle is. And then number nine. Be a dreamer. Be a dreamer. In order for you to have a delightful marriage, to have a delightful union, you got to dream. You have to think, what is my life going to look like 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now? What do I want to accomplish? What do I aspire to? Share your dreams with your spouse. It's a very beautiful idea. The Gemara says that a man meaning a person, not a man, but a person who does not dream in seven days, has no dreams in seven days, 
Hashem is not with them. It means Hashem has left them. So the simple meaning is, if you go to sleep at night and you have no dreams for seven days, and, right, for whatever that means, means that Hashem is pulled away. But I like to look at it like a person who can go by a week without dreaming. Go by a week, especially when you're with another person and you don't dream together what your life going to be like. How are you going to live and grow and develop and earn your Olam Haba together? If seven days go by and you don't discuss your dreams, then your marriage is stale. Your relationship needs a spark. You can't have seven days go by without a dream. So very quickly, one through nine. Number one, your spouse is in at 100%. Be 100%. Your spouse is in at 50%? Still be 100%, right? It's not tit for tat. Number two, be an interesting person. Read up on the news. If they're interested in something, make yourself interested in it as well. Number three, stay romantic, stay attractive. It's not okay to lose yourself. It's not okay to say, well, the courtship is over. I grabbed the person, I nabbed the person. Remain romantic. There's so many little touches that are romantic. When I go to the store, I buy something, I almost always pick up for my wife a chocolate or I pick up for her something else that I know that she likes. It's a romantic gesture. I'm not trying to fatten her up. <laughs> I simply want her to know that sometime over the past hour or two, I was thinking of her. And there's something beautiful about that. My wife has told me, Sometimes that's even nicer than, than, uh, than a big extravagant present. I want to tell you, I bought my wife a, uh, a, an engagement ring, and a few years later she lost it. It wasn't her fault, but she lost it. It was a diamond ring, a very expensive ring. So I bought her a second ring. And a few years later, she lost it. <laughs> oh, it wasn't her fault, it wasn't her fault. You know, I, I travel, we have 11 kids, can I and I, and she, uh, and, and uh, whatever it was, I don't, I don't blame her, the ring was lost. Do I say, well, look, I bought you two rings, what do you want? No. My daughter got engaged three weeks ago, we had a vart, a beautiful engagement party, right as the guests were coming in, I call my wife up to the bedroom, and I say, before you come down and greet the guests, I have something for you. And from out of her pillow, I hand her a box with a third engagement ring, all custom made for her. Be romantic. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. And it's the fire that keeps a marriage going. Next, whoever apologizes first wins. Don't be too big to say I'm sorry. And don't be too big to say I'm sorry first. Even if you think it was their fault. Don't forget to compliment. People need compliments all their lives. You look great. You smell great. What you do is amazing. My wife, she'll listen to one of my classes and she'll say, wow, I really like that. She'll ask me questions about it. Yesterday we drove back from Baltimore. She wasn't able to, I, I ran a Shabbaton in Baltimore. She wasn't able to listen because she was watching the kids. While I spoke, she asked me to repeat her talk. She showed an interest, and, and it meant a lot to me. N next rule, when you add a person to your life, it doesn't simplify, it complicates. But that's a good thing. Complication allows you to grow and allows you to be all you could be. And they may not be perfect, you'll discover, but they could be perfect for you. Next, your mood affects your relationship. Your mood affects your household. Get a grip. Get a grip of your mood. Right? Your face is public property. If you walk in and you're sour, you're bitter, everyone's going to see it and it's going to bring your spouse down. It's going to cause rift and dissension. Last two, be open about your spiritual struggles. You're struggling about something? Try to be open. Now, you don't have to say, I'm just saying, you don't have to say every mistake you ever made in your life. That's for the movies, right? Oh, I want to confess to you when I was 14. No, no, right? That's, that's between you and God, right? That's not for everyone else to know. But if you're currently struggling with something, be open about it. Your spouse can help you or at least understand. And if your spouse is open to you, don't judge them. And the last 
The last rule of the nine rules, how to keep it going now and forever, be a dreamer. Have a dream. Speak about your dream with them, and God willing, your dream will come true. You will find your shidduch. You will find your zivug. That zivug is waiting for you. They're going to see a person who knows how to apologize, a person who knows how to compliment, a person who knows how to be interesting. This all applies to those who are not married because this is the key. This is the key to open the door to allow a person to appreciate. They don't have to be perfect. Beauty is when opposites complement each other. If you do all these things, then God willing, you're going to live a happy, healthy, married life with lots of children. Thank you very much.